Good evening, family. Once again, I hope you had a great day, and we are looking forward to a wonderful evening. I've got kind of two surprises to share with you tonight, and then we've got some prayer requests because it is our healing service, and I've got several announcements because this weekend is going to be very busy. So hang in there. One of the first surprises that I want, well, the first surprise I want to tell you is that I've been working with the mayor's office about our opening up the churches, and we've been having difficulty. I've been working with the other pastors, too. And I finally got through and left a message, and then I got a return call, and it was Josiah Nishita, who grew up in his church, this church, and when her, his mother changed jobs, then they went to another church. But uh, I got to talk to him. He's now a deputy something in the mayor's office. And so caught up with the family news. It kind of reminded me when I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, years ago. And Spark Mahatsunaga was a um, senator, and he was my father's lieutenant. So I was going to let our group you know, visit with him and let him tour the place. And then when we got there and I signed in, all of a sudden the door burst open. And there were two young people. One was a young lady that grew up in this church. Her grandmother used to bring her to church. The other one was a guy whose family was a member. He was a member, too, and grew up in our Okinawa Dorfe church. And they opened the door, and they sang, Jesus loves me. This I know. I almost fainted. But Josiah, too, he's married now. He's got three kids and doing really well. And the good news is that the mayor has a plan. It has to be passed and approved by the governor, and there's some guidelines, but possibly... We're going to have it, if everything goes well, by Pentecost Sunday. So we're looking forward to that. So keep on praying. And the other surprise is that we're going to have another guest speaker. You don't have to listen to me tonight. Yay for me. I'm so glad to have help. Okay, but next Sunday is graduation Sunday. We want to be sure that all the graduates are registered so that they can have gifts. We're going to prepare for graduates who are registered with us. And the drive through to the front of the church, through the parking lot, will be from 8.30 to 9 o'clock. So don't be late because we've got to come in to do the service. So from 8.30 to 9, if you're a graduate, we're going to give you your gift and your lay as you drive back. Your families will have prepared your home or the patio uh, with a, an aisle. And then we're going to have a service where you're going to march down and then you're going to receive your diploma or certificate, and we're going to give a little message. We have a little service to honor you. It's not going to be very long because your families are preparing a barbecue. But if you're the graduate, tell them to respect the Lord and don't do cooking while pastor is preaching because that will make her very upset. <laughs> anyway, you guys do it. Relax and have fun. We, you're very special, and we didn't want to forget you. So be sure that you've got your name in so we have something prepared for you. And then we'll have the Sunday, night, Sunday service, and we're going to live stream it on Facebook again at 10 o'clock. And if we have any volunteers who have flowers in their yard or would like to string the lace for us so that we don't have to do it, um, we don't mind doing it, but we've got a lot to do. Uh, you can bring it on Saturday afternoon. That, that will help us a lot. And call Carol, and she will take care of that. And then Maui T-shirts are going to make special graduation T-shirts for our graduates. They are a Christian organization. We try to give them business. We're trying to keep them afloat, and they've been so good. They've given me you know, old T-shirts to take to the Philippines, extra T-shirts and so forth. And so we want to support them too. And so anyway, they'll have the souvenir T-shirts that we're going to give as gifts to the uh, graduates. But if you'd like to have a souvenir uh, T-shirt, they're going to design it real cute. Uh, it's going to be $10 per t-shirt, so give us your size, and then we're going to have some coffee mugs and uh, face masks. They have face masks in the colors of the schools, and they're going to be for $10 per face mask, so you help their business, but you also support your graduate, and I think Christians should be helping each other in, you know, supporting each other in business, so uh, just remember, uh, send in your request so that we can get them started on that. And then 
Of course, I had forgotten that it's Memorial Day weekend also, but it is our practice before we have a picnic, we go up to the Makawal Veterans Cemetery. And although this year we will not have a picnic, I want us, those of you who have loved ones there, uh, they're not gonna have a service there, but I want us to meet around the flagpole like we usually do to have our prayer, our song, and put lays on our veterans that are buried there. So we're gonna have a very busy weekend, keep everything in prayer, especially that we get open perhaps on Pentecost Sunday. That would be a great gift to us. Well, let us pray. I've got some prayer requests. Vivian Gabin, that's, who is related to some in our congregation, uh, was taken to hospice, the one by the hospital, uh, from the hospital. Uh, she is refusing dialysis, so they took her there. And guests are allowed if you have a face mask. So if you're related and would like to see her and cheer her up at this time and pray for her, uh, that's where she is, and we're going to pray for her. And Lake and Choi has been having difficulty walking, so we need to pray. Lynn has been a cancer survivor for a long, long time, and so we're gonna just pray that God will touch her once again. And June is a classmate who has an infection that the doctors are having a very difficult time treating. So while things are kinda, of, you know, not the same for us, there are others on top of that who are suffering. And of course, we need to pray for the state of Michigan because they've had tremendous rains and they had two dams burst. And you know, I can't imagine, it just makes my heart break to hear what people are going through. But God is our refuge and God is our strength. A very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and God is our strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore I will not fear, though the rain will be roaring, and though the mountains be cast into the midst of the sea. Father, we are so thankful that you are our rock. Jesus is our rock, and we can come to you and find shelter in the time of storm, in the time of all this turmoil. You are our refuge. You are our strength. And we give you thanks, Lord. You're so good to us. And we pray for these that have been mentioned tonight. We pray for Delisai, who is receiving cancer treatment. We pray for Vivian, who's been taken Lord, to hospice, and it must be a lonely time for these that are suffering. For Lei Kinchoi, we pray that you will strengthen her, and June's classmate, we pray creative ideas from you that you will give to the doctors to treat her from this infection, and we speak against these attacks in the name of Jesus. We declare, Lord, that you were wounded for our transgressions, you were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon you, and by your stripes we are healed. Oh, we look to the cross for our strength and our help, and you're a very present help in our time of trouble. And we pray for the state of Michigan. We pray for my friends in the southeast where big thunderstorms are expected. I pray for peace. Let us take authority, Lord because you rule everything, and you said, ask and we shall receive. So we ask for mercy and that you will stop all of that rain and the damage, comfort those that are being so attacked, and let them look to you. I believe you have something good, Lord. You're trying to get our attention. And so, Lord, help us to stop and see what you're saying to us. I give this evening to you. I thank you, Lord, that... We have Darlene to come and share with us how to prepare, what to expect. Because Jesus, we know even the unsaved ones are in fear and they're wondering what is happening. And you've got it in your word. You've got it written down so many thousands of years ago. You wrote it down for us to follow it like a roadmap. 
So bless Darlene, empty her of herself. You know the day she's had. I pray for peace. I pray for your anointing. Let her say what we need to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, people were wondering if Darlene was around. Darlene is uh, Henry's wife. And you know, when I first met Henry years ago, and he was single at that time, I thought he was going to be one of the 144,000 Jews because I thought he was... He's an evangelist and with such a passion, but then he fell in love with a beautiful girl. He decided he'd rather go up with the rapture than stay here and evangelize. He's doing a lot of evangelization now. And let me say this before I leave, uh, you know, sit down, that they are evangelists. They live by faith. And during this time, of course, they have not been able to keep their engagements. If any of you would like to support, if you got your bonus and would like to support them, you know, invest in the kingdom of God. That's the safest place to invest. So we pray that you will do that as Darlene comes. She is one of the most gracious ladies, a wonderful friend. I love her like a sister. We, we hardly see each other. <laughs> but when they come to Maui, they're always here. And when we go to Israel, we try to see them if they're in, you know, in town. But uh, she is just the epitome of grace whenever I've seen her. And I admire her so much for that. And then she's going to minister to us. I, I said that, you know, I've been ministering to the unsaved because they're so frightened and they got so many burdens and they need salvation. And to me, that is the most important. I told our people, you know, all of you know how to get saved and go to heaven. You know, I've got to now leave the 99, but I don't want to neglect because I believe that some people are not living as close to the Lord as they should, although they know the way. Because they don't realize the season that we're in. And Darlene studies a lot. I've learned a lot from her since she's been here. She's passed along things to me that I appreciate. And uh, she's going to tell us about, um, I don't know if I should announce it. Maybe she can announce it and say what God has put in her heart. But about the coming of Jesus. We believe in our church that Jesus is going to take the church before the tribulation. We are pre-tribulation. Tribulation is a period of seven years of, of great turmoil and destruction. We believe God's going to rescue the church before then, and Jesus is going to come before then, although this seems really bad. And then, of course, it's going to be worse during the tribulation time. But she's going to tell us to kind of get ready. We don't want to miss the rapture, whenever it is. You don't have to learn all the details, you know, and know everything. What you need to be concerned about tonight, every one of us, am I ready? Should the trumpet sound tonight? So, Darlene, let God just give you freedom. Take as long as you want. If they're busy, they can move on and come back to it later on. But I'd like for you to complete what God has laid on your heart, okay? Come, sister. Well, good evening. Shalom, shalom, friends, family. We love you so much. And it's such a blessing to be here. Thank you, Pastor Barbara. And I love you so much. You're such a blessing. And I really want to give God all the glory right now, just that uh, your pastor has graciously opened a room for us here in the church to stay. We weren't planning on being here uh, for for this period of time, but the Lord had other plans. So we thank God that uh, we have a place to stay, and that's been a great blessing to us. So I wanted to share with, with you all about the feast, the next feast on God's agenda. And you all know that we live in Jerusalem. This is where we've been living for the past 16, almost 16 and a half years. We moved to uh, Jerusalem from Maui. The Lord brought us from Maui, Hawaii to Israel. We thought that maybe we'd be there for four years, but it's been six over 16. So the Lord has us there, and we feel like we're there for such a time as this. Yes, we are evangelists. World Mission Outreach is an evangelistic association bringing the gospel to Jews and Gentiles, not just in Israel, but all over the world. And this is all by the grace of God. We just say we're willing and we're available. He can use you too. Just say I'm willing and I'm available. And I know the Lord has given you giftings. And uh, 
we're in a we're in a time where we all need to pay attention. This is uh, something that you do not want to take lightly right now. There are seven biblical feasts, and those seven biblical feasts are found in Leviticus 23. God has established a very meaningful and a very profound prophetic system through his choices of these seven holy convocations, and they're held each year by the chosen people. He gave the dates and the proper observances to Moses on Mount Sinai, and his instructions are recorded in the chapter, uh, in chapter 23 of Leviticus. And we see in the New Testament, we see the future events that involve the church and the Jews, all of God's plan from chaos to eternity, the revealed through the nature and the timing of these seven annual feasts. We know where we're at right now because the first four feasts out of seven have been fulfilled. And the first feast is Passover, which we know Jesus was the Passover lamb, and he shed his blood on Passover. He was introduced as the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus has completed that feast. He fulfilled it. And he, because he's the Lamb of God that died on Passover, shed his perfect blood so that you could be forgiven. Secondly, the next feast would be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, leaven typically, it's, it is symbolic of sin. So when you have unleavened bread, that is a symbol of, say, sinless, sinless the bread is not made with leaven, right? So it's interesting because on that particular feast, Jesus even took the bread. Would have been unleavened bread at the Passover feast. He broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Only Jesus could make a statement like that because that bread represents something that's, that's pure. Jesus had never sinned. He led a sinless life. So he's the only one that could make a claim like that, that this is his body broken for us. And that unleavened bread, Jesus was buried. He was buried on unleavened bread. He is, well, he's the bread of life. And he was buried on unleavened bread. And then what's the third feast? The third feast is the feast of first fruits. And this is when the priest would wave the offering, which would be, you know, these two uh, loaves of bread. And so Jesus actually is the first fruit of the resurrection, and there will be others to follow. And it could be, you know, you, me. So there will be many more of the uh, fruit of the resurrection, but he's the first fruit of the resurrection. So he fulfilled that feast. Now we're at the fourth feast. The fourth feast, Jesus had told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem because the Father was going to send uh, a gift. And the gift was going to come on Shavuot. That's the Hebrew name for Feast of Weeks. And it's 50 days after Passover. This is where we get the name Pente, Pentecost. So that's Greek. And, but it's actually Feast of Weeks. So what happened on Feast of Weeks was the Holy Spirit came down. And this is where we see that the church was born, Acts chapter 2. And so that feast has been fulfilled. Where are we right now? Well, we're in a summer harvest period. Because that's what would happen after, after Shavuot. There would be harvest that would be coming in. So we're in a summer harvest. Well, what should we be harvesting right now, friends? We should be harvesting souls, right? Because the harvest is ripe. The Bible says the harvest is ripe, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray for the labors. So each one of us needs to be praying for labors. And uh, we see it. We're out in the field, and we see that we always say, "Wow, well, Lord, we need more laborers out here. And it's so true. So let's all remember to pray for laborers for the harvest. So we're harvesting right now. But there's going to come a time when the harvest, when that particular harvest, the early harvest, will be up. 
And the next feast on that agenda, on God's agenda, is called the Feast of Trumpets. And this is considered the first of the fall feasts. And I'm going to explain this a little bit to you. The feast, it's also called the Feast of Memorial Blowing. We also, in Israel, well, we have, we call it Rosh Hashanah. It's the beginning of the year. Technically, the real beginning of the year would be Passover. Uh, but it's like here in America, we have uh, the school year, which would begin in the fall, but then we have our calendar year, which actually begins in January, right? So it's something like that. So Rosh Hashanah means head of year, so they would say Rosh Hashanah. But it's the Feast of Trumpets. The Hebrew name is called Truah. It means a loud and prolonged shouting. And um, the Hebrew meaning for Truah and Shofar, these two words are used uh, synonymously, uh, it, it meant to call an assembly or to declare war and advancement of the troops, to rejoice and celebrate, to announce the coming and the coronation of the king. So Feast of Trumpets is the big harvest, the rapture of the church. It hasn't yet been fulfilled. That's the next feast that's coming up. It's a holiday of promise. God seems to have enjoyed the trumpet. And uh, ever since Isaac... You know the story. Isaac was spared by virtue of the ram being caught in the thicket by its horns. The trumpet, or in biblical times, the ram's horn, the shofar, it was special to God. After all, without Isaac, we wouldn't have had the Jews. And without the Jews, we would not have the Bible, the apostles, the disciples. And we have to suppose that Messiah himself, God instructed Moses about trumpets on Mount Sinai in regard to this fifth feast. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. That's in Leviticus 23, 24. The first three feasts occurred in the first month of the Jewish calendar, and then Pentecost occurred at the early part of the summer, usually in late May or in early June. And on the Jewish calendar in the seventh month of Tishrei, which occurs in the fall in September, that's uh, when this feast of trumpets would occur. So this jump in time, it seems to represent the church age in God's planning, since the trumpet unquestionably represents the rapture of the church. And I'm going to get into that here a little bit. I just want to... Um, just organize myself a little better here. And if I have time, I'm actually going to share a very good testimony for you all tonight. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the trumpet and the field workers because back in the day, the trumpet was a signal for the field workers to come into the temple. So we know that in Jerusalem, that the temple you know, it's, it's high. It's higher than the city and the t uh, or the Temple Mount. And then the temple would sit up on the Temple Mount. So they would stand over into, I think it was, well, it was one of the corners of, of the temple. And they would, they would blow the, the trumpet. And the field workers would hear this, this trumpet sound. And they, uh, they would come. Oh, I know what it was. It was the southwest corner of the temple. And so the high priest was the one who blew it, and it would be heard all over these surrounding fields. And then what would happen is the instant that the, faith, that the faithful heard that, they would stop harvesting, even if there were more crops to bring in, and they would leave immediately for the worship service. And the, the Lord uses this image. We see this really clearly. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that's first. Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. 
Another scripture I want to mention is 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. It says this, says the Apostle Paul, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So imagine that you have two workers working side by side out in the field. And I'm talking 2,000 years ago. And they're working, and one is faithful, the other is not. And so when they hear the trumpet, they leave, they go up to worship. And the other one continues to harvest their crops. And this is something that we need to really think about very clearly. I want to talk a little bit about this. I want to talk about these events of the rapture. Because really, church, this is where we're at. This is is where we're at right now. And I know people are afraid. Um, Even last night, we were with two unbelievers. They're Israelis, actually. And they invited us to dinner, and we had dinner with them. And it was a wonderful conversation that I was having. Uh, it wasn't meant to be this way, but it came up. It was, it was talking about us teaching here in Hawaii, Messiah, in the Passover. And uh, he was rather shocked. He said, uh, Jesus celebrated a Passover? And I said, of course Jesus celebrated the Passover. He was a Jew. And he kept all the feasts. He, he kept the law perfectly. And he was really actually shocked about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what happened was he wanted to know more about him, about Jesus keeping the Passover. And as I started to explain what was going on in the upper room, and he stopped me and he said, the upper room, well, what do you mean by the upper room? And I said, you know, the Last Supper, have you ever heard of that? And he said, yeah, I've heard of the Last Supper. And he said, that was a Passover? And I said, yes, it was a Passover. So see, people are confused. They don't understand really who Jesus is or what Jesus has done and uh, how relevant Jesus really is. So it's important that we share Jesus because people don't know. They don't understand. Anyway, our conversation throughout the night was mostly about Jesus and um, Then we got into a conversation about end times. We got into a conversation about uh, the book of Daniel. I like, when I'm talking to Jewish people, I like to talk about their prophets and what their prophets had to say about um, the Messiah and also about the end of the age. So I was talking about the 70th week. And uh, then I went into the book of Revelation and started to speak about where we're headed and what's going to happen with Israel. Well, he was clearly very shaken by what I was saying, and uh, I could see it on his face, that it was very disturbing for him, and he got up. He got up, and he started to, you know, shake his head, and just try to move a little bit, and started to walk away, and said to my husband, your wife is very intense, and um, You know, I guess I am intense when it comes to talking about the things of the Lord because I believe this. I believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And you listen, if this isn't true, then, well, what am I doing? Why am I going through the motions? This is true. And therefore, I want to be obedient. Now, I'm not saying that I do everything perfect and I'm right, because I fall too. I, I, I mess up. But, you know, the word of God says, you know, that God is so faithful and just. If we confess our sins to him, not to going to the priest or Mary or somebody else, Uh, He says to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So we have access, we have access to him. And that's because of the blood that he shed and made a way, access for us to enter into the throne room of God. So praise God for that, right? 
I, I get chills thinking about it because, you know, we, I'm a Gentile. I'm not Jewish. And um, for me, I'm very thankful and grateful for the Jewish people because, um, you know, if you read Romans 9, it talks about to them was given the adoption and the, the, the temple and the sacrificial system and uh, the worship and even the Messiah. Everything was given to them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, about how we fit into all of this as the church. And who is the church? What makes up the church? Um, I think there's a lot of confusion. I'm not saying I know everything, but I'm a student. I love to study. And I think I have some pretty good mentors, and I thank God for that, that I've studied under. And, um, and I want to just share with you what I've been taught and see you know, you check it out. You be a good Berean and go in and you, you look up these scriptures and check it out for yourself. But I just want to encourage you that you cannot just believe what everybody tells you. You cannot just, we're beyond that, friends. You, you have to get into the word for yourself. You have to study it. And you have to be able to rightly divide it. Because we're living in an age where there's false teachers and false prophets. And if you do not know this word, you're going to be deceived. And so um, my prayer for you is that you will study the word of God and be a Berean. So I'm going to get back to trumpets. But I want to talk a little bit about, um, so this Jewish man was very shook up over um, the end times and hearing about the wrath of God. And listen, I know it's not the most popular topic, even amongst the church. I listen to pastors on YouTube, and I hear them, and many of them never talk about, um, they never talk about end times. They never, they never open up the book of Revelation and talk about it. And so most of the congregants don't even really understand, well, where are we at and where are we headed and what's happening? And I mean, look at what's going on in our world right now. I mean, the media is enough to scare anybody to death. So we have to be rooted and grounded and know that God is on the throne and he's sovereign and he will accomplish what his word was sent for to do, right? We can trust him. We can rely on him. I don't know who I can trust anymore, but I know, except for him, I know I can trust him. So I'm going to go to him and I'm going to, I'm going to open the word and I'm going to start to study and he's going to, he's going to show me like he'll show you too. So here's some key passages that need to be studied for an understanding of the rapture of the church. You want to be rapture ready, right? I know I want to be. And I want to be awake. I want to have my eyes wide open. I want to know what's happening around me. So here's some key passages for you so you can have a better understanding of the rapture of the church. John 14, 1 through 3. Oh, how I love this. And um, the night of the Passover, after Jesus left the upper room with his disciples, he was walking down across the Kidron Valley. Imagine, it's dark outside, it's nighttime. I mean, the disciples know something's up. This is not good. Something's going to go down. They're not exactly sure what. But as they're walking through the Kidron Valley on the way to where Jesus loved to go and pray, which was the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, this is what Jesus says. I want to read it to you. It's John 14. This is a very, very important um, few scripture verses that I'm going to read. I'm just going to read 14, 1 through 3. Jesus is comforting his disciples. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. It's beautiful, right? So this is a very key passage. Now this passage, it doesn't detail the rapture event, but it does contain the promise of it. 
um, in that Yeshua, Jesus, promised to return for the believers. Nothing is revealed here about the time or the circumstances, only the fact that there's going to be a coming of the Messiah for his saints. Yes, you're a saint. If you believe in Jesus, if you put your faith alone in Christ alone, through the grace of God alone, you are saved. It's not by works that you're saved. This is something that is a gift from God. So you would fall under that category. So the coming, especially for the saints, is the subject of revelation in the two other passages. Um, the passage does make one key point. The coming for the believers was for the purpose of taking them to the place where he was, where he was going. He said, I'm going, I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's coming to, to collect you, right? To take you to where he is. So where is that? It's heaven, right? So that's where he's taking us, to heaven. And this, is, uh, this will be a coming to take the saints to heaven and not to the earth. This is important because I know you may have heard this before, but there's, there's different schools of thought. There's, I'm like Pastor Barbara. I, I believe in pre-tribulation. I believe that the church will be spared the wrath of God, and they will be taken out before the tribulation period. So, But there are two other schools of thought, and that it's uh, post-tribulationism, where the saints meet the Lord in the air, and then they return with them to the earth immediately. Okay? Um, but that's not the promise here. I don't see that here. He's coming to take the saints to heaven. So the passage itself says nothing about the timing of the rapture, only that it results in the entrance of the church saints into heaven. So this fits very well with uh, pre-tribulationism. So that's one, uh, one of the key passages, John chapter 14, 1 through 3. And it's very comforting for me to know that he's coming. He's coming for us. His bride. The other key passage is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians. Let me just get there really quick. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. So this passage describes the program of the rapture. Paul answered a question that had been raised in Thessalonica, and the question was, do believers who have died miss out on the benefits of the rapture? That's in verses 13 through 15. Let me just read it really quick. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For... The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, therefore comfort one another with these words." Beautiful passage. So these living believers in Thessalonica, they understood that they, there was a rapture to come, but they didn't understand how saints who were already deceased would be involved in it. So some, uh, some of their thinking, they, they were thinking, well, only the living believers, they're going to enjoy the benefits of the rapture, and the dead believers are not. So this question arose because some of those believers some believers that had been in the church, they had recently died. Their loved ones who were still alive were distressed, not knowing what the future had in store for them. 
apparently while Paul was still with them. He had taught some of these uh, truths concerning the rapture as it related to the living but not to dead believers. So we see here that this was a big concern for them. They, they wanted to know, like, well, what about my loved ones that have died? You know, what's going to happen with them? So in reference to the death of believers, Paul used this term sleep. And we have to pay close attention to that term because it's used as a synonym for death. Uh, it's used for believers only, never about unbelievers. So the Bible views the death of believers as a temporary suspension of physical activity until the believer awakens at the rapture. So think of it like this. We go to sleep, right? Physical sleep. It's a temporary suspension of our physical activity. But does that mean, I mean, our physical activity until we wake up? When we wake up, of course, we get back to our physical activity. But is there a suspension of our mental activity when we're sleeping? No, we still have mental activity. We're dreaming. We're still having mental activity. So death is a temporary suspension of physical activity until one awakens at the resurrection. These verses do not teach something that you might have heard of called soul sleeping. Doesn't teach that. Um, for there's no cessation of spirit soul activity, only physical activity. So let's move on here. Let's talk about three things I want to talk about here, actually. So these deceased believers, they're going to benefit from the rapture before the living ones do. So say my mother, okay, I'll take my mother as an example. She's a believer in, in Yeshua. My mother, she's already gone on to be with the Lord. But when the rapture happens, these dead in Christ, their bodies will be resurrected first before we're caught up with them, so the ones that are alive. So I'm assuming that I will be alive at the rapture, and if that's the case, I will be caught up with those that have already gone before us, and I'm talking specifically in the church age, this church age saints, and I'll get to that in one second too. Where am I at on time? Ooh. Okay. Um, so anyway, these deceased believers, they're going to benefit because they're going to go first. So there's a chronological sequence of the rapture event. It, and, it, and I'm not going to go into all these stages, but there's several stages to those events. But I'll just real quickly say this. There's going to be a shout. And that Greek word for shout is a command. It's a military command. It's like a military leader who would come out of his chief commander's um, tent, and he would issue a command. So one day the chief commander is going to come out of his heavenly tent, and he's going to give a shout, a command for the resurrection and the translation of believers to occur. How glorious is that? I mean, should we be frightened? I really believe this, that we are going to be taken out of here before all this really bad stuff happens. We think this is bad right now. This is nothing in terms of what's coming up, friends, seriously. You don't want anybody to have to go through that. But God is so full of grace and mercy for his, for his body, his bride. He's not going to allow us to go through that. So, Thirdly, the voice of the archangel. Angels are often used to set God's plan into motion. So Michael, the archangel, is going to be used in this way regarding the rapture. Doesn't say here what the, the voice, you know, the content of what the voice says. And that's not stated here. But it is known as a military procedure that can be applied to the situation. So, like, say the commander-in-chief gives a command to the sub-commander. And then, of course, he's going to go and he's going to give that command. So Yeshua gives the shout or the command for the program of the rapture to, be to begin, and it's Michael's task to set it into motion by repeating the command. And then fourthly, you've got with the trump of God. There's a lot of confusion on this one. 
So the sound of the trumpet was used, like I said, as a summons either to battle or to a call to worship. Uh, but with Michael's repetition of the command, the trumpet's going to sound, and this triggers the rapture itself. And the trumpet is going to serve as a summons for the plan to move into motion. Fifth, the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is, like I said before, you know, the dead is going to rise, uh, the resurrection of the dead saints. Uh, they're not going to miss out on any of these benefits of the rapture. They're going to get to enjoy them first. So anybody that is, you've heard the term in Christ, they're going up. So let's see what else I have for you. Six, we have... Okay, but before I, I go to six, the Old Testament saints, they won't participate in this rapture. That's going to be later. They'll be resurrected at a later point in God's prophetic program. So it's only the church age saints. And not to be confused with tribulation saints, because that's a whole other thing. Because if you look, you are not going to see, and I even took some notes on this because I went back and I reviewed it. If you look in Revelation, you see the church mentioned all throughout chapter 1, 2, and 3. And that deals with the events prior to the tribulation. But, and later you see the church again in chapters 19 through 22, which deal with the events after the tribulation. But 6 through 18, you don't once see the church mentioned at all. Why? Why is the church never mentioned six, in, in chapters 6 through 18? Well, the tribulation is going on. I don't believe the church is going to be here for a number of, of reasons, and there are scriptures that can back that up. But anyway, you have to study that. You have to study that out. So I want to mention something about the last trump also, because I think this is also very important. A lot of people think that the last trump refers to Revelation and that it's going to be that last trump that, you know, uh, identifies, you know, that the church is coming up at that point. So, and usually that's people that believe First Thessalonians 4.16, they're usually mid-tribulationists or post-tribulationists. They try to identify with the seventh trumpet of the, of the book of Revelation, but you, you can't do that. And I'll tell you why you can't do it, because um, Paul, when he talked about this in 1 Corinthians 15, the book of John, the book of Revelation that John wrote, it hadn't even been written yet. So it's impossible. John hadn't written the book of Revelation, so the Corinthians would not have had any knowledge of the seven trumpets. So it's not that. But I'll tell you what's evident here is the fact that Paul used, he used a definite article, the last trump. He expected the Corinthians to know what he was talking about. And the only knowledge that they would have had of trumpets are those spoken of in the Old Testament, especially those of the Feast of Trumpets. So the last trump refers to this feast and to the Jewish practice of blowing trumpets at the feast each year. Now, during that ceremony, there's a series of short trumpet um, sounds. And they then conclude with one very long trumpet blast. It's called the uh, Tikea, Tikea uh, Gedola. And it means the great trumpet blast. And this is what Paul meant by the last trump. So as such, it says nothing concerning the timing of the rapture. This is in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. But again, we can tell that what this last trump is um, from 1 Thessalonians 4. 16. And, um, and that's really, really cool. So remember definite article for the last trump. And then remember that John hadn't written the book of Revelation yet when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians. And then, so it's, it's so we know what's happening. So in this passage at the sound of the trumpet, the dead saints are raised, they're raised incorruptible, it says. And the living saints will be changed. Thus, in verse 53, the problem of corruption, which keeps the dead body out of heaven, will be solved. Through resurrection, it will become incorruptible. We're going to get a glorified body. How cool is that? 
I mean, you might be sitting right, listening to this right now going, you know, I have arthritis, you know, I have this problem, I have that problem. Well, guess what? You're not going to have it when we're raptured. You're getting a glorified body. You know, sometimes I wonder if people think that when we talk about this, if they think that this is some kind of fantasy land, you know, or sci-fi or something. Well, I could actually say that about what's going on right now. You know, I could just watch mainstream media and say, am I in a bad dream? And, and I'm dreaming all this crazy stuff right now. No, it's actually happening, right? So really, we have to get in God's word and we have to study it. And so we know where we're headed if you're a believer in Jesus and you've put your faith alone in Christ alone, then you are going up at the rapture. I believe that with all my hearts. So I told you that the, I may have not have even told you this, but, but the third important passage that deals with that change of the nature of our bodies is 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. And uh, it's a very important one. So write, write that one down and study it out. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. I'm not going to read it for, um, for time's sake. But verse 50 declares the necessity of that change that our, our nature, our, cha- our body, our physical body has to be changed. And uh, in fact, I'll just read that part, uh, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So that's got to go. So the background, if you want the background of that statement that, that Paul made, it's in Genesis 2.17 which says this, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And that's further developed in Genesis three seventeen through 19, when God said to Adam, because you have hearkened into the voice of your wife, and you, you've eaten of this tree, of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field, in the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return unto the ground, for out of it were you taken, for dust you are, and unto dust shall you return. So because of sin, man has become subject to corruption and mortality. We've all inherited that from Adam and Eve. So all men are guilty. We're all seen guilty of participating in Adam's sin by imputation, according to Romans 5, 12 through 14. And you can write that down, and you can read that later too. Romans 5, 12 through 14. It's a good idea to really use that scripture, because when you talk to people that are not saved, they maybe need to hear that. Romans 5, 12 through 14. And I'll read it. I guess I'll read it right now. Because maybe there's somebody out there right now that you're not even sure you are saved. You're not sure you're going. I mean, do you ever ask yourself, "Um, where am I going when I die? What if I died tonight? Where am I going? And if you can't say, I'm going to heaven, and you can't tell someone the reason why you're going to heaven, then there's a problem. And I hear it a lot because I'll ask people, You know, I'll ask them that. Have you ever asked yourself where you're going if you were to die tonight? I hope you don't, but have you ever asked that question? And some will say, yeah, I have. And I say, well, where are you going? And some will say, well, I'm going to heaven. Why are you going to heaven? And this is when you really find out if they're born again. Because if they say they're going to heaven because they're a good person, they're lost. Because God's word says that none of us are good. Our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. And really, it's actually very arrogant and prideful to think that we could work our way to God. Why would Jesus have had to come, step down off of his throne in heaven as as God, take on flesh, and then suffer on our behalf? Why would he do that if it was works-oriented, that we could work our way to heaven? So you need to really think about that. And if at the conclusion you find out that, wait a minute, I'm a sinner and I don't even deserve to go to heaven. 
None of us do. It's only God's mercy and grace that have allowed us, you know, that gift. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's love, that he would send his only son to die in your place. It makes me want to cry just, just thinking about it. So if you're not saved, you don't know where you're going, you need to get saved. So God knows you, and he knows your heart, and you repent of your sins. Turn from your sins. Confess them to God, and then invite him into your life to be your savior. To, if you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh and that he died and he rose from the grave, you will be saved. So let's get back to, I guess we covered it really, you know, so we're sinners by nature. So mankind is living under the sentence of de death where his physical body is subject to corruption and mortality. The sin nature is in it, and the results of sin are evident in the death of the body because ultimately we all die. And um, this kind of body that's subject to sin, mor mortality, death, and corruption, it can't enter into the eternal state. So a change has to be necessary, either by resurrection or translation before our bodies can enter eternity. And that's what Paul is speaking about here in verses 51 through 53. Here's the necessary change, which is where he tells you a mystery. And he tells you you're not, not all of us are going to sleep but we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So the quickness here, the emphasis is on the quickness and uh, the rapidity of, of the change. Um, it's also done in a moment. And the Greek term behind this word is the origin of the modern English word for atom. You know, atom, the little atoms. <laughs> the emphasis is that this will be in an atom of time. It will be that quick. And furthermore, it will be in the twinkling of an eye. This is not a reference to blinking. Some people say that. But rather, it's a, to a sudden flash of recognition. It's like seeing a person and then suddenly recognizing who he is. It is the sudden flash of recognition that's meant by the twinkling of an eye. So this too emphasizes the quickness of the change. So there you have it pretty much for uh, the rapture of, and, and the timing is a whole nother story. Uh, we don't, I just want to say this about the timing real quick. The timing, there are no preconditions to the rapture. So the timing of the rapture is it could happen tonight. See, if we talk about tribulation, we know certain things have to happen. Sequentially, there has to be things that happen. Um, the same thing with the second coming of Jesus. There are conditions upon his return. But the rapture of the church is a different story. It's imminent. could happen tonight. Are you ready? Are you ready if the Lord comes tonight? I hope you are. So I'm going to probably stop here. There's one thing I do want to leave you with, and that is, that's Jeremiah 8.20. Because you have to think about that sadly only a small portion of the Jews, the remnant, which is in the church at the time of the rapture, will see this magnificent fulfillment. Because you know the church is composed of Jews and Gentiles that believe in Jesus. This is the entity. So now you have Jeremiah lamenting over the situation in Jeremiah 8.20. He says, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. So for the remaining Jews of the world who will not participate in the rapture of the church, God will have a restoration to the promised land. So uh, that's a whole other teaching, but please pray for the house of Israel, and uh, we pray that you'll be ready for the rapture. And let's just pray right now, really.
Can we do that really quick? Do you want to come up, Pastor Barbara, and pray? For, or you want to come up, Henry? Somebody come up and pray and say bye. Yeah, well, I want I want you to pray for the people. Yeah, God bless you guys. Aloha. We love you so much. Pastor Barbara wants me to come and pray with my wife for the conclusion of the service. Wow, Darlene, you're a good teacher. Thank you. Now you're my favorite teacher. An invitation. Yes, yeah, so, so we want to pray for you. Uh, thank you, Sally, for teaching. So we want to make sure if you know Jesus, God the Son in your heart, be at peace. We're going to pray for you to be at peace. If you don't know Jesus, we want you to pray with us today a prayer of repentance. So I want to do two prayers. I want to pray for you. As a believer first, for peace and shalom and for the service. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. We pray for the service. Thank you so much for using my wife, Darlene. Oh, God, thank you for using my life the last two weeks, Lord, to share the word of God. And my wife and I thank you for Pastor Barbara to invite us to pray and to share the word of God to the world from this place. We ask you, God, in Jesus' name, the Messiah, to bless this church, <clears throat> the believers, everybody to be found dwelling in the vine. In Jesus the Messiah, walking in obedience, dwelling in Jesus, the Son of God. And one day, Father, you will say to the Son, Son, the house is ready in heaven. Go get the bride. And John 14 says, Oh God, that your Son Jesus will come back and pick out the bride, the rapture, the church out of this world to meet your Son in the air. And through Jesus, come into your presence for the wedding ceremony, prophesying in Revelation 19, 6 to 8. So thank you, Lord, so much for the believers. Bless them to walk in obedience, Lord. Now I pray finally for the second prayers. If you don't know Jesus, if you're a Christian struggling, walking in sin. So if you don't know Jesus, and you're struggling, walking in sin as a believer, so pray with me these prayers. A prayer of repentance of sins and a recommitment in your heart to the Lord mm -hmm. Jesus. Pray with me these prayers. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. You are the Lord God. You are God. You became man, died on the cross for my sins. I repent of my sins today. Forgive my sins. Change my heart. Forgive me, O oh God. Your blood cleanses me from all of my sins. Mm -hmm. I believe you are risen from the dead. Now, Lord Jesus, be my Savior. Be my Lord in my heart forevermore. Holy Spirit, you seal my heart until Jesus comes back for me. And thank you, Jesus, because who you are, and what you have done presents me right before the Father. Amen. If you, pray, if you pray the prayers in the name of Jesus, you are welcome to God's kingdom. Call the local pastor in your area. Tell them you can turn on Jesus the Messiah and this meeting to follow up with you. Or call Pastor Barbara at this church. Shalom to you. Shalom, shalom. Thank you for your prayers Thanks. for us as we go back home. And um, may yeah. God bless you. Thank you for praying for us for our marriage and the ministry. Thank you. Bless you.